Well, Jeremiah, thank you very much for being on the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Great pleasure. Thank you. Um, so older people who live in the United States know quite well who you are. People like me, especially I'm an immigrant and I'm so right. a millennial. Uh, we know about you from this fantastic documentary that was released a few years ago, The Last Magnificent. But the one the reason for that is you became this celebrity chef and then you disappeared. And now you live in Mexico. Right. How's Mexico? Well, it's on the right side of the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, I mean, I ended up in Mexico for various reasons, but mainly it was, uh, you know, the beach and it was warm. And there was scuba diving, which was my absolute passion. So I just stayed here. Ended up by accident and then stayed. Well, that's a great place to be to end up in, by accident in. Yes. Let's talk about uh, The Last Magnificent for a second. So sure. that documentary, it was produced by Anthony, Anthony Bourdain, right? Right. How did it come about? Well, Anthony um, had read California Dish, which is my first book, which is now Start the Fire, the, the, the newer edition. And he went to the woman, uh, Lydia Tanalia, at this amazing company in New York called Zero Point Zero, who were filming all his shows. And he said, Lydia, we have to, you know, make a, a film out of this. And so she read the book and she said, no, he seems like an arrogant prick. I don't want to do that movie. <laughs> And he said, well, trust me, trust me. I know him very well. You know, we have to make the movie. So I met Lydia for an hour in San Francisco. She said, it'll just take an hour. Let's do a little interview, send it to CNN, see if they're interested. Well, the interview went into seven hours um, and we really liked each other. So CNN said, yeah, let's do it. That's how it happened. Did you know Anthony prior to that? Yes, yes. We first met in New York at his restaurant. Um, when he was running that, and I went in and I, he came out of the dining room and said, well, what do you think? I said, the food is terrible. <laughs> and he said, yes, I know. <laughs> well, it was, he said it was his restaurant. Right, right. Well, you... <laughs> well, he was the chef there. It wasn't his restaurant, but he was the chef. Well, you're a very nice person, I could tell. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's how he became friends. Yes. Yes. And were you like close friends or you just... Uh, no, no, talk? I mean, occasional talk to and, and meet in public events and that kind of thing. But I got to know him very well, you know, during the, the filming and also especially during the, the time we went around and uh, publicized the documentary. Yeah. How is Anthony outside of camera? He The most intelligent person I've ever met. I mean, certain, uh, lots of intelligent people, but not everyone who's that smart can put all their brains through their mouth. You know, he was, his mouth and his brain were perfectly connected. I mean, he, he was the, a genius at sound bites, but he was also very interested in everything. And I, I, for instance, admired him a lot because he used his show as a political purpose. You know, I mean, he went to Iran and he said to show Americans that Iranians are not all devils. They uh, have children and they sit at table and have dinner. You know, he wanted to show that. And Libya did the same thing. So it, it was very brave of him because CNN could have gotten upset. Yeah, and after you watched the documentary, was there anything that you wish wasn't there? Or w were you not satisfied with certain parts? Well, in the beginning, I said to Lydia, when we had that first interview in, in San Francisco, I said, Lydia, <clears throat> I just have two requests. One, we take the high road with Alice Waters. And two, that I have absolutely nothing to do with this film, what's in it or how it ends up. And she said, well, that's interesting because those are the two demands we had of you. <laughs> so, and I, I just thought, no, I mean, I'd, at that point, I'd have enough publicity. I didn't want to do another fluff job. I just thought, let it all hang out um, and see what they make of it. I mean, at the end, it's a, it's a brilliant name, very embarrassing name for me, The Last Magnificent. I, mean, I hope I'm not, and certainly not. Um, and then at the end, you know, walking up that staircase, artists are lonely people and all that rubbish. <laughs> a great ending for a film, but absolutely not who I am or, or what the situation was. But you have to admire they did a great job. Yeah, certainly. I, I, I truly enjoyed it and that was fantastic. So you've been you've known as the father of uh, American cuisine. 
how do you define American cuisine? Well, I mean, that, that's the question, isn't it? I mean, what is, what is California cuisine? What is new American cuisine? Um, in the beginning, you know, the big change that I made in, in the United States, in California, in Berkeley, at Chez Panisse, was that I, it was much more an approach. In other words, it wasn't recipes. Um, it was in those days, you know, in the early, in the early 70s, mid 70s, a famous restaurant in the United States had famous ingredients like Dover sole and foie gras. But the foie gras was this disgusting pate, you know, out of a little can. <laughs> and, the, and the Dover sole was frozen and old. When I was shopping in, in the Bay Area for Chez Panisse, I'd go to the meat companies and I saw the famous names of all of the names of all the famous restaurants in the Bay Area. And it was all frozen, frozen solid. The meat was frozen, the fish was frozen. And I just said, no, I can't uh, cook with that. Um, so I said, my approach is all about ingredients. We'll go to the market every day, see what's there, and then make a menu. So you make a menu from the ingredients, not the other way around. And that was the huge change. That's interesting. Now you look you look back, and it's it's such a common sense approach, almost right. And somehow well, it, uh, it wasn't. Well, it wasn't in the United States. Of course, it was very French and Italian. I mean, they didn't know any other way. And another <clears throat> thing I found fascinating is you don't have a formal culinary education, yet you are accredited for defining the American cuisine. Do you think that lack of that education actually helped you? Lack of education definitely helped me because I didn't know what I couldn't do. <laughs> I, I mean, <clears throat> my palate was everything that was in front of me, you know, and I didn't know what you shouldn't do, whereas uh, the hospitality industry in the States was full of rules. And I didn't know what they were, so we just did what we wanted to. And you've learned a lot of that uh, in your childhood. So let's talk about your childhood. Tell Which me... one? <laughs> your ch... <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. It's uh, it's fascinating, but I wanted to kind of summarize how you see it, what you remember the most. Well, of course, it started in Connecticut and then ended up in, and then went to Sydney, Australia. <clears throat> then we went to then London and Paris and then ending up in Boston. But by that time I was 17 or something. So, but the childhood was, I mean, traveling all over the world in luxury because my parents were paying for it. <clears throat> and I remember, you know, the great ships and the grand hotels and grand restaurants. And that is what, you know, really educated my palate and my interest in food. And my favorite m memory of early childhood was catching a, a barracuda on the Great Barrier Reef and then cooking it on the beach. That was brilliant. Yeah, I've read that <clears throat> you, you, you credited that experience uh, to your interest in food in general, right? Is that, is that fair to say? Yes, well, you know, out the, the tropics and grilling and fresh fish and all that, yes, yes. So you said that your parents, uh, you traveled because of your parents. What did your parents do? My father was the managing director for the international division of Western Electric, which was, you know, uh, they invented stereophonic sound. Um, so you used to see it under all the movies. It was either RCA sound mm. re recording or uh, Westrex. That so he went all over the world and, and managed whatever the wherever we were. No, that's that's cool. And I'm I'm assuming because of that he had uh, friends all over the Hollywood or I, I don't know cinematography in general yes yes well especially the anything to do with sound as i say his company invented stereophonic sound um and you know people would we had a, a speaker in our house and people would come from all over the world to listen to it <laughs> uh yeah it was fascinating and you you had uh siblings i believe brother and sister yes and what did they do like I mean, I mean, what what do they are they also in uh, culinary at all or? No, my brother was a, a soldier, a Green Beret, Special Forces character in Vietnam, and my sister was an English teacher, English professor. You are all very different. Interesting. Yes, yes. How did your parents influence you? Well, I didn't like my parents very much, so uh, I was happy to be taken out to great restaurants and traveling on the Queen Elizabeth and. Queen Mary and uh, eating out of the, London's best restaurants, but um, they they certainly taught me how to behave, you know, and taught me manners. 
so that I was able to, you know, write that book a couple of years ago called Ta Table Manners, How to Survive in the Modern World and Why. <laughs> yeah, and uh, before I, I continue digging into this topic, I just want to tell listeners that you actually permitted me to ask you anything I want. So I don't anything. want them to think I'm, <laughs> I'm very rude. So what exactly? Uh, you, you said that you didn't like them. Is it because they were preoccupied with something else and uh, didn't pay enough attention to well, you? Or the, what was the... the... Both my parents were party animals. My mother was a roaring alcoholic. Uh, and my father, they loved entertaining. I mean, they entertained at a lavish scale, both at home and out in restaurants and everything. Um, so we just had very different ways of, they were, they were too busy. They should never have been parents. They did their best. Um, and it was a pretty good job uh, with all of us in terms of, you know, the, the things we enjoyed, but they should never have been parents basically. And your brother and your sister, you, um, how was your relationship with them? Um, we hated each other. That's a fun family you've lived in. What? What's well, the I was deal? The, I was I was the youngest, and my brother and sister were jealous of me. And my well, my sister was you know in school in the United States when we were living in Australia, so it was uh, a bit different. And my brother was four years older, so I was just a pen in the ass to him. It wasn't really a family life, you know. Got it. Got it. Yeah, it. I mean, definitely in, in, interesting uh, life you had as a child. You have uh, interesting mem memories of as, as a kid. Yes. And do you think if you had a regular childhood, like, I don't know actually how you define regular childhood. I mean, if you had happy childhood as you would define it, do you think it would affect your future? Like, would you still become who you are today? or what That's a very good question. I think not. I mean, I learned very early on uh to take care of myself and to you know grab the world by the throat and make the best of it that you can i mean i was in boarding school at the age of seven you know and, and then on and forever um and we i mean at one point my father put me on a, uh, a ship to from london from southampton in england to new york and then on a train from New York to San Francisco by myself. I'm 14 years old. <laughs> and he said, you're going to see your grandparents have a good trip. <laughs> that's fascinating. So well, that's just I, same. it never occurred to me I wouldn't do it. So I, I was you know, ready to do it, take on the challenge. Do you think your father just wanted to raise you as a independent or it's just the way he was? Just, just wanted to get rid of me. Okay, I see. Okay, <laughs> that, that's fine. So, yeah. so he and my mother could, you know, party even more. Interesting. So let me ask you this. You've been spectacularly successful in life, right? And you basically, all the chefs, everybody in the uh, in this world know you. Would you trade what you have now for the happy childhood? Oh, absolutely not. Because, you know, I didn't see my my childhood is that unhappy i mean everyone else when you see the film they all think oh my god what a terrible childhood you had but you know i had my own suite at the hyde park hotel in london on hyde park for three months by myself um i had my own horses and i you know used to fox hunt and all that sort of stuff so it wasn't that miserable it was just unusual well now i mean in America now, they would call, you know, social service that they have my parents arrested. <laughs> but in those days, it was much more, more normal, especially in England, where you ignored your children. Got it. And if I went to school with you, let's say uh, elementary school, how would I describe you as, uh, as a person? Oh, very well behaved, except when I wasn't. I was expelled three times from English schools <laughs> um, just because I was, you know, American and I just I didn't know the rules. Uh, they kept telling me the rules, and I thought, well, those are stupid. I'm, you know, um, I'm not sure how I would describe myself. Probably as uh, arrogant, bossy, not a team player. But you know, I'd, <laughs> I'd been, I'd traveled around from, I'd gone from Connecticut to Sydney to London to very three schools in England and one school in France, which actually turned out to be housed in the 
old headquarters of the Gestapo. So, you know, wow. It was a, a colorful childhood, put it that way. Which country did you like the most out of all you lived in? I, of all the ones I've lived in? You know, France, I think, was my, my favorite. England, too, but France, for sure. Got it. You were too American for kids out, out there, but you still enjoyed the, the culture. Well, when we moved to uh, Sydney, you know, I was a Yank and I had an American accent. So then we were supposed to move to, uh, which is a huge disadvantage in those days in, the, in Australia. Then we moved to London and I had an Australian accent, so I was an Aussie and an outcast. And then when we were moving to the United States <clears throat> to go to prep school, uh, I thought, well, I better lose this accent. And of course I hadn't. And, the, and when I got to the States, my accent was incredibly popular. Oh, please say something. Say it again. Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. In, in your book, you also talk about your aunt and your Russian uncle. I'm yes. Russian, so I'm excited to hear about those people. What's, uh, they influence you a little bit, right? What's, tell me about them. A huge influence. My aunt was my, you know, the, the woman I really wanted. It's my mother. And my uncle, Konstantin Zakachenko, was a uh, space scientist. He, he invented the first jet helicopter that, that, that would fly. And I used to have lunch with them, you know, with Sergei Sheremetev, who, <laughs> when I was 16, told me about his childhood friend, Yus uh, Yusupov, who had killed Rasputin. So I was just... Oh, my goodness. In, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were amazing. Amazing to be, to be with them because it was so colorful and so, yeah. When did you start having these lunches with them? I believe it was some regular uh, meetings. Every once in a while you see them, right? Yes, about three or four times a year. They lived in Washington, D.C., and I, you know, I wanted to go to school and live with them, but my mother wouldn't have it. Um, but when I went to Harvard College, I was sent off by my aunt <clears throat> with her recipe for chicken livers with 100-year-old Madeira, and she sent me with a case of Madeira. <laughs> that was my education. <laughs> well, that's nice. <clears throat> What did you study in Harvard? It was uh, in Harvard College. It was a Bachelor of Arts. And then uh, the Graduate School of Design, I just studied uh, architecture. Oh, I, I, I've read somewhere that you, you studied underwater architecture or something like that, right? I wanted to do, I was designing underwater structures and people at Harvard wanted me to do public housing because I wasn't interested in that. And uh, so I said, no, I want to do this. And they said, well, if you do it, you have to leave and go to MIT. We'll, we'll chuck you out. And I kept saying, uh, no, 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 underwater architecture. So I did my thesis underwater architecture, and then, then they more or less chucked me out. <laughs> But it was my Russian uncle who used to give me the declassified booklets from NASA, all about these wonderful materials like uh, they use for rockets. And I just use it to design underwater structures. Is it true, and I'm not sure if it's just a rumor, but one of the reasons why you were excited about underwater stuff is Atlantis? Like you were yes. looking for it? I mean, is it true? Well, I'm fascinated by, you know, that television series called Ancient Aliens. Now it's gone a bit off the rails, but uh, early on it was amazing. And <laughs> there are so many, every culture has the same stories about it. So I was... Um, you know, in college, I was studying the all the long ancient poems of Iran and Persia and everything, and they all talk about it. So I thought, well, it's worth worth investigating. And also, I knew that the, I thought the future of the planet would be a lot of it would be underwater and and fish farming. That was part of my uh, thesis when I was graduating from design school. Of course, they all thought it was insane. <laughs> yeah, it sounds interesting. <laughs> I just say, and how did you end up in Berkeley? I was on my way to Hawaii. Um, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I graduated from architecture school. I was a terrible architect, at least for you know public housing. So I was on my way to Hawaii to convince them they were about to do a new World Fair, and I said, I'm going to convince them to do the World Fair half above water and half below water. So. But I ran out of money in San Francisco, and I couldn't get to Hawaii. And that's when I saw, you know, an ad in the newspaper about Chef. About Japanese. 
Yes, they put an ad in the, in the newspaper saying that we're looking for a chef, so, somebody who, somebody who loved Elizabeth David, and um, Fernand Point. Help me understand. So you you never studied uh, culinary, yet you see this um, advertising on the from Japanese, and you decide to go and try yourself. Well, I had twenty five dollars left in my name. You know, I had to eat. Uh, <laughs> even then, twenty five dollars wasn't much. And to go over and get interviewed was, you know, I think $2.50 round trip in those days. So I was counting my money and I thought, well, first of all, my friends who showed me the ad, I said, so what? I'm not a chef. What's it got to do with me? And they said, well, if you've only got $25, it could have a lot to do with you. <laughs> <laughs> so I went over and took the interview. How did it go? Well, of course, they said the interview is at six o'clock. I didn't know anything about the restaurant business, um, except to be a customer. Um, and I should have known when they said six o'clock, when they opened at six o'clock, it was a stupid idea. <laughs> um, I mean, you would, wouldn't give an interview then when you're about to greet your first customers. So I showed up and of course they suddenly realized Alice was in the head of the kitchen then said, um, no, we can't give an interview. Come back tomorrow and, and reschedule. So I went out onto the sidewalk and realized I was, you know, couldn't afford to come backwards and forwards. So I walked back in the kitchen and I said, excuse me, you told me to be here at six o'clock. It's now 6.10 and I want my interview. And they said, okay, <laughs> just fix the soup. There was this huge pot of soup that, you know, everyone was, you know, eight, eight or a hundred people were getting soup that night. So I tasted it and I thought, hmm, it just needed, you know, a little salt and a little cream and they were so impressed. They said, oh, yes, well, you, you know, definitely come back. Give us some idea of what you would be doing here, what dishes and menus. And so I went back and did them. And I got the job. So when you started, how was Japanese? Can you describe it? Oh, it was a little local. The Japanese was just a little local French bistro. I mean, very beloved in Berkeley, but not really not famous anywhere else, particularly part a few people in San Francisco. But it, you know, I mean, first day on the job, I was by myself in the kitchen. They said, "Cook lunch." <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> so, but fortunately, I, you know, I had a, a great taste memory. So all my life, the things that I'd love to eat in England and France and Italy and California. Um, I knew how to get there. I knew how to get to the taste, even if I wasn't, didn't have the technical skills yet. Um, somehow I found my way to make it taste delicious. So did they have a menu? Like a no, high... no. Okay. No, 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 no. We did the, I would write the menus for the okay. week. And then um, depending on what was available, I'd look at the markets and talk to suppliers and what they were going to have. And then sometimes uh, that menu didn't appear at all, you know, because I didn't like the ingredients. So <clears throat> then later, you know, I mean, the menu changed every day. At, when I opened Stars in San Francisco, the menu changed every day for lunch and every, every night for dinner, seven days a week. Yeah, that's... I mean, now that's insane. Yes. But I didn't <laughs> know we couldn't do it. So we did it. I mean, you did it in Japanese, you said, yes. and started yeah, every day. Okay, yeah. and uh, walk me through that. Like, whose decision was it? Was it you who decided to go that route, or it was originally designed like that? No, it was originally um, Alice would write the menu menus a week in advance, uh -huh. uh, and then there was no choice. It was just a set menu, depending on the day, and people would come by on Friday and pick up the menus and look to see which day they wanted to come in. What food appealed to them the most? Got it. At what point you decided that uh, the, the the cuisine should move from French and kind of focus on local ingredients? What well, was the it was, process like? My my emphasis from the first day was uh, perfect ingredients. I mean, I was there. They said cook lunch, and the produce started to arrive. And I looked at it, and I thought, I can't cook with this crap. You know, I mean, it was it was not from a farmer's market or anything. It was just from the commercial market. So, I mean, the, the famous story about the green beans, I mean, they were, 
as thick as a pencil or pen, you know, I mean, they were impossible. So I said to the people at the, across the street, oh, we can't, I can't use these. You have, I went across the street and said, you know, I need some different vegetables and fruits. <coughs> Excuse me. So Alice came running down uh, and said, you know, you can't uh, send those back. Those are friends of ours. And I said, well, okay, then you cook with them. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a bit of a fuss in the kitchen. And then I said, no, but I'll, you know, I'm just going to cook whatever I find. So whether it's the menu that was written for tonight or not, I don't, I don't care. I'm just going to cook of the best stuff that's in the house already. And then immediately I started going to the farmer's market and, and getting people to bring me stuff from all over Napa and Sonoma. So if they put you in charge of kitchen, given your lack of your background as, as a chef, what was their background? They were, they didn't have any background neither? No, no, no. I okay. mean, at that point, Alice had, you know, eight or 10 people helping her in the kitchen. Um, so when everybody disappeared except for one, Willie, the famous Willie Bishop, who was a cocaine snorting, uh, peppermint eating sous chef drummer, beatnik drummer, <laughs> but he could, he could, <laughs> I mean, he could chop up mushrooms faster than because he was such a good drummer. He, he would take two <laughs> Chinese cleavers and chop up, you know, 20 pounds of mushrooms in, in minutes. He was brilliant. You couldn't taste anything, but I could. So that was, that was fine. Do you remember when there was the first positive review in the, in the press about Japanese? Yes, right away there were some local little newsletters and things, but the, the main one was the first article in Gourmet magazine about Japanese, saying how amazing it was. Um, and that's when some people came in with, you know, with their condolences saying, now it's the, it's the beginning of the end. You know? <laughs> Now, if you're going to be famous, we don't want to be here. That very Berkeley reaction to that. Oh, really? Interesting. But and, then it became world famous. And walk me through that process. Suddenly, you have all these people flying, I mean, at least driving from other a part of the state, right, to try Japanese. Oh, yes. And, you know, when people would visit California, San Francisco, they'd come out there. Um, but I... I connected Shapenese with friends I called James Beard and said, you know, you've got to come and see us. Um, and then he wrote in his column, which was throughout most of the newspapers in the United States, he said, my four favorite restaurants are, and he mentioned one in Texas, Tony's in, in Houston, which was red plush, you know, waiters and uh, very fancy sort of red plush and, and Ernie's in San Francisco, an Italian restaurant in New York and Shapenese. Well, no one had ever heard of it. Everyone said, what, how, if it's one of James Beard's favorite in the United States, it must be amazing. So we got a lot of attention from that. And then I um, found people in San Francisco, I mean, like Cecilia Chang, the recently just great and late Cecilia Chang. And I went to her cooking classes and then brought all those rich ladies back to shape and come and try shape and ease, you know. So I promoted it. Uh, as best I could. Uh, James Beard, he was a he, he was a, a famous critic, right, or something like that. He, an author. Um, he was the most important figure, probably before Julia Child, and then equally as important as Julia Child, not for TV, but for his books and um, and the, he called, you know, every chef every day on the telephone and talked. He was amazing. That's nice. And at some point, you decided to leave Japanese. Was it yeah. because of the conflict with Ellis or because you just kind of picked it as a professional Japanese? Well, you know, the, the, the sort of conflict with Ellis <clears throat> was actually built in the press later. At the time, it was not a problem. I gave, I saw, I gave them my notice a year. I said, a year from now, I'm leaving and you, know, you can buy me out. Because we're all equal partners with Alice. Hmm. And it didn't make any money. And, and they, they weren't business people. And I said, we should do a cafe upstairs for various reasons. I mean, I always try and put a cafe next to a big restaurant because 
you can take all the food from the night before. There's any that's left over and turn it into lunch, and we sell it twice. So it's you know <laughs> a brilliant thing to do. And nobody would, only one person of the partners uh, agreed. So I finally said, you know, you're not making any money. Um, this is, a, I know this is the saving thing for Chez Panisse in the future, uh, as it actually has turned out to be. Uh, I think the cafe is almost more famous than the restaurant now. And uh, I just said, okay, a year from now, I'll just move on and open my own restaurant. And you did. I wanted, and I wanted to m move to San Francisco. I took it as a much more serious place than Berkeley. And uh, I believe your next place af after you moved was uh, La Ventana or something like, like that? Yes, in Ventana. And then that got burned out. Well, it didn't burn down, but the fires, everybody abandoned Big Sur for a while. Uh, so I didn't go back. And because meanwhile, an opportunity to do the Balboa Cafe to redo it. Um, and then later, because of that connection, the Santa Fe Bar and Grill in Berkeley, um, which was the restaurant that really promoted American regional food. So uh, you mentioned a Bobo Cafe. And yes. I, I believe those uh, be belong to uh, Moon family, right? Yes, Noel Moon and his partners had the Balboa. He also had the Santa Fe Bar and Grill with... Um, uh, Mark Miller and his partner, there were four of them in the Santa Fe Barn Grill. Um, but we just bought them out immediately and revived it. Is there anything significant about the, that period of your life? Did you uh, add something to your arsenal, to your tools while working at those cafes, at, at those restaurants, or you pretty much uh, had this, I mean, this the same skills as in um, Chepani? No, I mean, they were completely different. The Balboa Cafe has 90 seats and a, and a kitchen that you would build for 30 seats. So I certainly learned efficiency. I mean, there was a tiny area that had a walk-in refrigerator, the, the cooking stove, and the dishwashing area. So one had to be very, very organized. You know? um, then at the Santa Fe, was a much bigger place, but also we had to promote it. So I started doing regional dinners from around the United States. We did one from Michigan and invited the uh, uh, the governor of Michigan who came with the whole entourage. You know, so it was, it was a lot of fun. But also we opened that restaurant in a week, wow. actually in five days. So that certainly taught me how to uh, be flexible <laughs> and get it done. Let's talk about stars now. That's that's quite an yes. interesting uh, period of your life. Whose idea was to open stars? I mean, the concept and the location and all that sort of thing. Mine, yeah. And where did it come from, the, the whole concept? Well, I love the old huge restaurants in New York. Um, uh, you know, and also places like La Coupole and Bourse La Trois in Paris, um, Simpsons in London. You know, I just love that whole, very organized, very professional, not totally amazing food, that was the point, but they were amazing restaurants. So I thought, you know, I want a brasserie where everybody's welcome, where the bar is just as important as the food, the service all on an equal footing as the best you could possibly do. And as it turned out, I mean, it was right by the all the arts, by the ballet, the symphony. Who did you start the stars with? Who are other people? I started with a man called Doyle Moon, who was the owner of the Balboa Cafe and my partner, uh, equal partner in Santa Fe Bar and Grill. And I brought him in because we needed, you know, more confidence from the bank. And he had those two restaurants. And also because um, I thought he you know, knew the bar business, hmm. uh, which I didn't. You know, I'd never run a bar, even though I'd worked at Balboa, um, <clears throat> but only the food, really. So it, it turns out that he was not the genius behind the bar at, at Balboa. It was his partner uh, who knew. And so uh, we, we, we set, parted ways quite quickly. So he didn't want to work. I thought having a 50% partner meant I would do 50% of the work. 
<laughs> it turns out I was doing 150% of the take, so no thank you. So what made you confident that you can open this type of restaurant? Is it that your personality that you, you just don't care or you actually had this something very similar experience? Because Star was a giant restaurant. It was like, what, 500 people per, yes. per night, right? Yes. What gave you that confidence? Well, I'm not sure I ever had the confidence, but, you know, again, once again, I didn't know. Uh, I mean, I love a challenge. You know, I was vaccinated with a challenge needle. <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought, I mean, everything about the restaurant in the beginning was everyone said it's a disaster. The location was a disaster. The concept was a disaster. The open kitchen was a disaster. None of, no one had ever done this stuff before. But every time someone told me that, well, it's never been done, I thought, well, Maybe it's time. So going back, again, Stars was serving about 500 people a night, right? How yeah. do you prepare with this type of opening? Like, how do you hire people? How do you train them for your very first night? Well, fortunately, and I think the huge part of the success of Stars, that I came in with a team that had been working with me for two or three years at the Santa Fe Bar and Grill. The same team that when we were told by the bank, on Tuesday, and you better be open on Saturday for the cash flow. So we, and we did, we, it was somebody else's restaurant, uh, you know, and I closed it and opened on, on the Saturday. I, I mean, that's not what one should normally do, <laughs> but we did it and they survived. And, you know, after that, it was sort of like, we can do anything. <clears throat> and those are the chefs that went became pretty famous later on as well, right? Are, are there those, those, those people? Some of them? Yes. Uh -huh. Well, it's the ones at Santa Fe Bar and Grill were the team that I taught at the California Culinary Academy uh, three or four years before. And so I just took my top people from there and said, come on. I mean, one was Alaska, f fishing for salmon in Alaska. One was in Hawaii. One was, I said, <laughs> come on. Back here, we're opening the restaurant that we always talked about. I mean, Mark Franz went on to open Farallon and uh, the what's the one next door on the on the bay. So there are lots of lots of chefs who came out of stars. That that's fascinating. So when you work with these people, would you tell that they are going to become independent, very successful chefs in the future, or it, it's not something that can easy to predict? It's easy to predict if you're not looking for, not listening to what they say. <laughs> you know, I was a sous chef here. I was, a, you know, everybody in America sous chef has worked for me at Stars. You know, it's amazing how many thousands of employees I've never heard of. But it's the attitude. That's what you recognize. If someone says, you know, I'm a great cook or whatever, I, I can make the best omelet, fine, show me. But that's not as important because you can teach all that. What you can't teach is attitude. So for instance, when Dominique Crenn, her first day there, I thought, aha, you know, I said, you're, you're working a station tonight. So it's funny. Uh, I actually interviewed her and I asked her about it. And she told me that you basically uh, empowered her to do stuff, even though yes. she, she also never had the education. Right. How, how would you trust somebody who doesn't have that background to have something so, so have so much responsibility. Well, I would show her the dish that I wanted. I would cook it for her, and then she would do it. That's yeah, talent. That's pretty cool. <laughs> that's cool. So let's talk about stars. Like it, it became a destination for politicians and celebrities overnight, right? Yes. What? How did that happen? Well, the, the location was. Uh, I chose it for very specific reasons the same reasons that everyone told me I was out of my mind, you know. It was, I mean, when we took it over, it was homeless center and garbage blowing everywhere. It was just disgusting. It was a little alley off the civic center, but that civic center had, you know, the had the center of government, all the law offices and the lawyers and the ballet and symphony um, and opera were there. So I thought, that's why I called it stars. I wanted, you know, the stars of the, of the performing arts to be there all the time. And that's exactly what happened. I thought to myself, 
okay, the curtain's like at seven o'clock or 7.30. We'll fill the restaurant up with people going to the symphony or opera, and then we'll have regular customers, and then they'll come back afterwards for oysters and champagne or drinks or whatever, you know. So we, I, it was a built-in two and a half terms, and that's exactly what happened. Was it successful from day one, or it took some time for a word of mouth to uh, go around? Well, we ran out of money when we were opening it, so, you know, there were no light fixtures and things like that. <laughs> but as soon as, you know, after a month, everything was finished, uh, and then the place filled up right away. And it's crazy when I'm looking at uh, old uh, pictures. This is a very common concept right now. Open kitchen, big restaurant where yeah. everybody is made. But back then you said it was something new, right? It was all new, yes. Did you yes. see it somewhere in Europe or it also was some idea of yours? Oh, yes. I mean, it was the big brasseries in, in Paris, you know, that gave me the idea. And, you know, so, not Sardis, but I forget the big restaurants in New York that I went to as a young child. Um, I just loved that bus on Simpsons in New York, of course, is vast, you know, so big that they, you know, pushing trolleys around the dining room with huge haunches of beef and mutton and everything. Yeah, I loved all that. Oh, the other day I read the article about uh, stars and they, inter they interviewed a person named Denise Hale. And she, yes. she was a patron. Can you tell me about her? Denise, of course, brought everybody in from, uh, um, I mean, all of Hollywood. She'd been married to Vincent Minnelli, who made the movie Gigi that was so famous. And so she knew everybody in Hollywood and then she would bring them up. She knew, you know, because of them, those contacts, every couturier, you know, um, if they were doing a thing for Saks Fifth Avenue or Bergdorf Goodman or anybody, uh, Neiman Marcus, they would come into town, she would host a lunch or a dinner for them. So suddenly, Stars was the place to go and see very famous people. Um, I mean, and also the performers, I mean, Pavarotti and uh, Rudolf Nureyev, and I mean, you name it, they were all, they all came to Stars. Yeah, that, that that's fascinating. And do, did you become friends with her? Oh, yes, yes. I was just thinking the other day, um, you know, how certain rumors get started. Somebody who was here in Puerto Vallarta was, the rumors started, they was very ill and of course they weren't ill at all. And I told them the story that, you know, when Denise Hale's husband was very sick and we went to the hospital every day for 10 days. And then the rumor went around San Francisco, oh, Jeremiah is so sick, he's dying. He has to go to the Presbyterian hospital for treatment every day. <laughs> the fact that I would come back to Stars and have a bottle of champagne with Denise didn't seem to stop the rumors. So uh, I was very close and I used to go stay with her at the ranch in Sonoma. Is it possible to recreate stars today or there are too many similar restaurants already? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the great brasseries of the world are still, well, apart from right now, I mean, this apocalypse, who knows what's happening? Not much. But the idea, so that Johnny Apple, who is the New York Times uh, restaurant critic said, Stars was the most democratic restaurant in the United States. So one night at the opening of the opera, there was uh, Danielle Steele sitting there in, in her $150,000 Dior um, gown. She had on one finger a $2 million diamond ring from Graf in London. And on the other hand, it's twins. So that was $4 million in diamonds. And no one was allowed, of course, near the table. No red wine could be poured near the table. She had water. Everyone had to drink water. I mean, the damage they could have done to that dress and everything. So she had salad with that dressing on it, you know. And at the table next to them were two couples, underage. So I brought them champagne and poured it myself <laughs> so they wouldn't get arrested. Um, and they had saved up for months, you know, to have that dinner. And because they'd come in three months before and asked me, you know, could they come in? Was it okay if they were underage? Um, so that was stars, you know, and, and at the bar where, you know, the local hounds drinking draft beer. So, I mean, all in one night. Do you know if your parents read about stars or your, your siblings? Like my sister, um, 
knew about it. My brother, but my parents died before oh, I opened. Sorry. No, I mean they, they died from partying. <laughs> God, you're terrible, man. <laughs> I mean, my parents' generation they have lunch. Let's say if they were in London, they would go to lunch. There'd be two martinis before lunch, wine with lunch, and cognac afterwards. And then they'd come home for dinner or go out again, and it'd be the same. Two cocktails, wine, cognac, um, and, and smoking, you know, a pack or two packs a day. Yeah, I'm surprised they last as long as they did. Yeah, it's not a healthy style. Definitely. No. And no exercise. Yeah. And, and back to stars. What was the craziest story that you remember? Oh, my favorite crazy moment was one night, uh, Friday night. I mean, it was absolutely packed. You couldn't even move. Um, and it had the front door, one of the doors was on an alley on uh, Golden Gate Avenue. And sorry, on, on, uh, on Main Street. And then the back was this sort of alley. And a homeless guy naked comes, opens the door, comes running through, you know, and I th it's a disaster because that's chaos that is not interesting. I mean, he was dirty and smelly and, and obviously homeless and naked. So I couldn't let that just occur because if I didn't do anything. So I stopped him in the middle of the dining room and I said, get this man a glass of champagne. <laughs> and he stopped and looked at me like terrified, you know? <laughs> well, he, he never, he didn't stay long enough to drink the champagne. I drank the champagne, but he ran off, you know, and the whole restaurant stood up and clapped and cheered. That's so that's how, you, that's how you turn a disaster into success. That's fascinating. Like that's pretty witty too. I wouldn't think about it. That, that that's great. So, do you think stars would be around today if not for earthquake? I mean, forget the pandemic. I mean, up until last year. Or yes, something. correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I think so because of the location. As long as it, I mean, what ruined it was the earthquake. Not so much right after the during the earthquake, uh, that was bad enough, but they shut down the civic center for two years. So all the government, all the lawyers, all the performances, everyone was gone. So we went from 325 lunches to four. Mm, yeah. And that sort of $7 million loss in revenue in those days, um, which would be like you know, 30 today, um, was just a lot to bear. And I believe at some point Star Wars, Stars was uh, one of the highest grossing restaurants in the country, right? Yes, I mean, Tavern on the Green was the highest. It was $20 million in those days, and we were 10. But given the number of seats, so it was the formula, you know, the yeah. the revenue per number of seats is what put it at number two. Got it. And uh, you sold it before the disaster, right, or after? I sold it in 1998 to a Chinese, uh, an Asian group out of Singapore, uh, and they ran it for a year and then sold it to a chef who ran it for a year and then it was all closed on a scale from one to ten how would how tired were you of the restaurant industry at the point you were selling oh i wasn't tired because i mean i then opened a restaurant in manila and in singapore and uh seattle everything so um what i was tired of was the administration hmm. and the bureaucracy of it and that i was happy to let somebody else do but the actual, you know, the performance every night and every day, yeah, never tired of that. At some point, you moved to New Orleans, I believe, right? I moved to New York right after that. Mm. And then 9-11 happened, and I moved to New Orleans. And then I was, uh, hadn't really moved in yet. So I thought I'll just go scuba diving for uh, two weeks and pull myself together and then come back and start all over again because i'd written three or four books while i was in new york so i thought okay well what's next but i'll figure it out when i'm in new orleans great place to eat oysters and have fun and when i was in mexico uh katrina hit oh, God. new orleans and so i'd lost 90 percent of everything i owned was, was gone wow so i looked around after about 30 margaritas later and i thought well <laughs> if i'm going to be if I'm going to be ruined, I might as well be on a tropical island. I was on Cozumel. So I stayed. 
and scuba dive. For how for quite a few years, right? Before you, you know, a little less than a year after that, because then Wilma, Hurricane Wilma came in and, and devastated Cozumel. So I moved to Merida inland from there because there were no earthquakes, no tsunamis, no uh, hurricanes, nothing. So were you involved in the restaurant industry from that point until you came back for the uh, Tavern on the Green? No, not at all. I mean, Tavern on the Green was the first one. And I had a relationship with Tavern since it was always the competition between, yeah. well, it was never a competition. They had twice the revenue that we did, but it was, we always talked about in Nations Restaurant News uh, together. So Anthony Bourdain told me, Jeremiah, it's insane, but uh, you know, you can never, never make it work. Nothing can make that place work. Um, and I thought, he said, it's way too much of a challenge. And I went, challenge? <laughs> so there I was. And what's the, the most difficult part of it? Is it because it's so big that it's almost hard to control the quality of food? Or what is that? No, no, because, I mean, uh, okay, it was, they potentially did a lot more volume than stars. But, you know, stars could do up to a thousand a day. So, uh, because there were two private rooms and the cafe, mm -hmm. uh, so a thousand a day on, on a great day was not impossible. And we did a really good job. It was very organized. Everyone knew what they had to do. Um, the problem with tavern is that the owners are morons <laughs> and they had no experience, uh, had no idea how to run a restaurant. I mean, they, would, they just, everything they did was to destroy tavern i mean i mean okay so the first thanksgiving the first year they were open it was the thanksgiving and it was i told them how to do it you know how to do the reservations and they said no you're the chef you don't know anything about reservations well you know i designed the reservation for the stars and it went on for all those years very successfully so i said no you 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 can't take 2000 reservations you know you should take 600 that's it because that's what we can handle. And over the whole day, fine. But they took, you know, 1500 reservations and then didn't know how to manage it. Then they did what the ultimate sin when you own a restaurant is you show up at peak hour with 15 or 12 of your friends unannounced and demand a table oh. is what they did. I, so of course, everyone got backed up and there were a hundred people trying to get in waiting. It was very cold outside, uh, furious, you know, and yeah. Then they did the second most stupid thing to test the waiter, they said. They all just gave their orders, you know, for 15 people. And then they got up and switched places so that now the waiter has no clue who order what because it's all done by table number by seat number so they did it just to test the quality to show off to sh they thought that was showing that you knew how to run a restaurant yeah that's a wrong time i guess so let me ask you this so if not for the owners do you think if it was just your place you would make it work it would have taken uh would never have been as great as stars because we couldn't get the staff no one wanted to work there mm. But, you know, with enough money and time, yes, we could have. And what would be the things that you would change just outside of owners? Like what was the easiest thing to fix? Nothing really easy to fix because the way they had built it, it was very difficult to manage. They got everything in the wrong place. The bar was in the wrong place. Got it. The, the back dining room, you had to walk through the bar to get to the back, you know, lots of things. But as I said, with enough money, a couple of hundred grand, uh, close for a month and do it and you'd be back in business. Got it. Got it. So you mentioned you wrote the several books and uh, uh, although some of them are cookbooks. Uh, there is a book of, more of uh, autobiography, right? Mm -hmm. There is also the book about the manners, as you said. Like, Can you kind of right. uh, give me a brief overview of each book? 
Okay, there was Cooking with Master Chefs, which I did with Julia Child. That was from a television series. California Dish, which was the memoir, which I did in 2002. Um, America's Best Chefs Cooking with Jeremiah Tower, which was a PBS series of uh, film and the cookbook. Um, a book I wrote about a Scoffier called A Touch of Genius. That was for uh, Amazon. Um, of course, the first book was Jeremiah Tower's New American Classics in 1905. It got the Beard Award. Table Manners. Oh, and my, one of my favorite projects was The Great Book of French Cuisine by Pellepra. And a publisher, a friend of mine in New York, had the rights to it. But it had been done in the 50s by a uh, home economist, and it was just a mess. <laughs> that was thousands of recipes. I really had fun you know, rewriting that one. Good Cook series I did with Richard Olney for Time Life in London and in Alexandria, Virginia. And a couple more, which I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, and the star, star of the Fire is uh, the old, uh, the latest book, right? You said it's... Uh... Yes, that's the new version of the new edition, rewritten California Dish. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. I, I read some of it, not everything, but I, I, I very much enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, so when you were writing these books, right, as particularly your biography, you have to kind of go back and uh, dig into your memories and rethink certain things, right? Was there a moment where you would look at something that happened and kind of perceive it from a different angle? Oh, yes. I mean, uh, not, not just the successes that you might have you know, done differently, but all the failures. <laughs> I think... I learned more from my failures than from the successes um, in terms that I had kept all the press and not that I ever read it at the time, but, you know, it was all the local newspapers saying what had happened at stars and what Denise Hale was doing and what was served and all that kind of thing. So I had that in New York with me and I could write from that material. So a lot of it was not me remembering. It was taking it from the newspapers and mm. magazines. Um, I never looked at my press unless it was bad. Then we had a meeting with the staff and we tried to correct it. But I never read the, the stuff that was very positive. I would post for the staff to read, but I wouldn't read it. I mean, Lifestyles and the Rich and Famous, all those things that happened and the videos from the BBC and CBS. I mean, I never looked at those until later. So you only focused on those negative reviews? Because you can do something about it, whereas the positive reviews all you do is your head swell. But it, 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 it start to, you start to believe you're impressed, which is a disaster. Do you ever read this negative review and think, "Okay, guys, you just don't understand." Bye, or you really take everything, all of them seriously, and they all write. What's your attitude towards that? We take them all seriously with the staff. I mean, some privately. I just thought these guys, you know, doesn't know what they're talking about. I mean, I had a long-standing feud um, with uh, the Chronicle restaurant critic, Michael Bauer, because he, you know, he had the best 100 restaurants every year and did a list, 100 best restaurants in the Bay Area, and he never listed stars. I mean, it's just absurd, absurd. Well, screw him. Yeah. I'm not bringing him on podcast, then. Uh, uh, <laughs> so... You had a fascinating life. Is there a period of your life where you would like to kind of go back and constantly relieve it because it was so, it was more fascinating than anything else? Um, no, I never looked back. You know, the only time I've ever looked back was when I was writing the, the memoir, but uh, which is a very strange experience. I mean, all that stuff comes alive again. But I never look back. Once something is done, it's you know, it's in the file cabinet. I'm on to the next thing. So you never uh, miss that story. Like, I, I've written about stars, and I'm fascinated with that stuff, even though I'm pretty far from from restaurant industry. I'm myself right. fascinated, and I'm, I can't imagine the person who built it. Like, if you didn't, you don't really, really uh, relieve it again, but I guess, whatever. No, I, I mean, I got the answer, yeah. It was done. It's done. Next. <laughs> Great attitude. That's that's Thanks. awesome. Jeremiah, I have this quick blitz for you. I'll ask you a quick question. You give me a quick answer. Sure. Uh, what's your favorite movie? 
I would say uh, anything by Nick Gray, Johnny Guitar. What's your favorite song? I Will Survive by uh, Gloria Gaynor. What's your favorite country to visit? Italy. Your favorite dish? Scrambled eggs with black truffles. Who's your favorite chef? Living or, or dead? Both. Both. Okay, so dead it would be Fernand Point and the one the man who had the Cote d'Or in Saulieu because they did the chick, poached chicken stuff with black truffles. Mm. It's got to be unbelievable. Um, and I adore um, Le Bernardin in New York. Who do you think is most overrated celebrity chef? Oh, for sure, Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> I thought you would say that. Why? Why? Why do you think so? Because the hospitality industry is not about embarrassing people, making them cry, and making them feel small. It's the absolute opposite. But you're pretty tough person too. Understanding and making them feel great. Oh, but I know. I know. There was in my restaurants. There was no shouting. No intimidation none of that okay what's the first item on your bucket list um top of my bucket list i think is apart from all the projects i'm working on um november in a villa in tuscany for a month yes again for sure top of my list got it got it and uh, last question um, what life advice would you give to younger self? I would say, you know, I mean, chaos is a great formative force for success. So the more chaotic and the more impossible it seems to do, that's the one you go for. Well, that's that, that's fascinating. Thank you very much, Jeremiah. It was a pleasure Thank to you. have you on the podcast. Oh, pleasure to be here and great questions. Thank you. Thank you.